Hello, I'm Dan Gibson, and welcome to the fourth video examining the question, how did the early Muslims calculate the Qibla direction? So far, we have examined three topics with three videos. In the first video, how did the early Arabs accurately determine the four cardinal directions, that's north, south, east, and west? And the, the emphasis here is on accurately determine it. Then we looked at the Arab windrows, or the 32 directions, and how could they accurately fit in these 32 directions. And then in the third video, we looked at how did the early Arabs measure distance. In this video, we want to add some further information. Now, before we start, we must get ourselves into the mindset of the early Arabs. They did not have a map of the world. They did not even have a map of the Middle East. They didn't think in terms of maps, nor did they think in terms of latitude and longitude. Those had really not been invented yet or been introduced into their world. Now this is where most modern people face a wall. They cannot imagine a world without thinking of maps. So how can I describe what was in the Arab mind? First of all, the Arab merchants thought in terms of the Arab windrows with its 32 distinct directions and 224 points in total. Every place that they went to, they would this Arab compass would follow them around and it was like standing in the middle of the compass. The Arab knew that to get to a specific direction, he would have to walk a certain number of steps. The merchants in Arabia had established the number of steps through countless repeated trips. Those numbers were firmly established in his mind. So in his mind, the Arab merchant thought in terms of connecting wind roses. And whenever he walked along, the wind rose followed him around him. He stood in the center of the wind rose. He would start here in a certain spot, and then he would go a certain number of steps in a certain direction. Now, this was aided by what is called isharat, or local guides. He would know that you reach a certain mountain or rock formation after so many steps, and you would go off in a certain direction, and you would walk those steps, and you would arrive at that point. That mountain or rock formation was a local guide. Along the route, he would know that there were hidden tanks of water in the desert. These had been carefully constructed by the Nabataeans over the centuries. The Nabataeans knew where these tanks were. Now here is a water collection system on top of this pile of rocks. The small channels or set stones direct water, rainwater, towards one of the uh, places where, sorry, the small channels or set stones direct rainwater towards one place. Whenever it rains, the small channels direct the rainwater towards the hidden cistern. Here is my friend Herb beside the entrance to that cist, uh, cistern by that pile of rocks. Many Bedouin have placed, uh, uh, sorry, we have to go back. Here is a water collection system on the top of this pile of rocks. This is what it looks like from out in the desert. Now, small channels or set stones on this pile of rocks direct water towards one place. Whenever it rains, the small channels direct the rainwater towards a hidden cistern. Here is my friend Herb beside the entrance to the hidden cistern on that pile of rocks. Most Bedouin, the modern Bedouin, have placed a metal lid on that. Uh, in the past, there would have been a rock over it so the water could run underneath, but keeping it from evaporating. The rainwater runs under the lid and into a large bell-shaped chamber carved out of solid rock. Many of these water uh, cisterns were several stories deep, holding thousands of gallons of water. Now, long ago, the Nabataean merchants learned that the problem in the desert was not the lack of rainfall, it was the lack of water storage. But for anyone passing by, 
the pile of rocks in the desert looked just like a pile of rocks. They would never imagine that there was water there, plenty of water, not too far away, and that water came from whenever the rains fell in the desert. It wasn't a lot of times, but there was sometimes five, six, seven inches of rain over a year. Now, here is a Nabataean dam built across a crack in the side of some rocks. This dam is out of sight of those traveling by. It's just sort of around a corner in the crack. Whenever rain falls, it is collected on the rocks above and it is channeled into the place behind the dam. At the bottom of this dam, there is even a tap which could be opened to obtain water. Nearby, there is graffiti scratched on the rock, I'm sure by people who are sitting there waiting for their camels to drink the water. Now, these water collection systems formed a network of ashurat, or local guides, along the way. The merchant uh, uh, caravan master, he, they, they knew where uh, these were, and so they could find their way from one location to another. So in their minds, there were entire networks of windroses, and as they walked along, this windrose was around them, and it, they could, um, it would just, they were standing at the center of the windrose. Now, one of the things they did was they kept this network of water cisterns secret. This ensured their safety, and they could disappear into the desert, pursuing thieves, bandits, armies could not follow them because they didn't know there was water in the desert. They also kept their navigational knowledge secret. They did not want others cutting into their monopoly on Nabataean trade. So keep that in mind. This is a secret, a carefully guarded secret. But back in 25 BC, they were their own undoing. Remember this date. Let's examine the story for a moment. Back in 25 BC, the land of Yemen was actually a number of different kingdoms. Here is a rough map of these kingdoms. For our sake of illustration, we will limit this to the three important kingdoms. For centuries before this, the Nabataean camel caravans would arrive each year to purchase the frankincense harvest. Each year, like clockwork, these camel caravans would appear out of the desert, arriving in the Sabaean uh, kingdom, and uh, they made the people there very happy because um, they would uh, come and arrive and buy frankincense. So that kingdom put pressure on all the others uh, to buy their incense. So the incense moved inland and then moved to these camel caravans. The bulk of the incense was grown over in the Hadramaut region. From there, it was moved inland, and so the cam uh, so these kingdoms all faced inland towards where the camel caravans would arrive. And so it was sold to the caravans, and these men would disappear into the desert. Now, this system worked for centuries, and it was just the way things were done. But eventually, this kingdom took a larger and larger portion of the proceeds that came from the sales, probably in the form of taxes or tariffs. Now, something else was also happening. The Nabataeans were growing in their knowledge of the use of sailboats. They used a Latin or a triangular sail, which allowed their boats uh, to have a great deal of maneuverability. The only threat they faced was when, the, uh, was when the Egyptian navy, let me go back, the only threat they faced was when the Egyptian navy put military boats on the Red Sea. One clash we know about was when the Ptolemies moved five Egyptian uh, quadrimes uh, into the Red Sea and they clashed with the Nabataeans. The Egyptian boats either used oars or a square lug sail. They were not very effective on the Red Sea, where the winds were often contrary to where the ships wanted to go. And the Nabataean dhows could sail away from these slow-moving triremes. Uh, a second event took place in 30 BC, when Cleopatra 
and Antony. You remember them. They are famous. There's lots of stories about them. But at a certain point, they wanted to escape to India. So they dragged boats from the Nile over the, uh, the desert to the Red Sea in order to escape to India. Now, the Nabataeans became very alarmed uh, at this uh, fleet uh, showing up on the Red Sea, and so they sunk the Egyptian boats. Seeing their way of escape cut off, it seems that Cleopatra and Antony took their own lives at that point. Now, from this point on, the Nabataeans were the sole masters of the Red Sea. So in 25 BC, the date we mentioned earlier, Nabataean boats started appearing off the southern coast of Yemen. Now, since the, uh, the kingdoms on the inside facing the desert were enforcing taxes and tariffs on the frankincense, the Nabataeans started to deal directly with the Himyarite uh, kingdom. Now, the Himyarite uh, Yemenis, they got some frankincense and they used inflated animal skins to make rafts and they floated their cargo out to a small island. You can find this story in Agatha Christie's... Uh, sorry. Agatha Chidi's. The Himyarites uh, used inflated animal skins to make rafts, and they floated their cargo of incense to a small island. You can find this story in Agatha Chides uh, 87, and it's cited by uh, Diodorus and Strabo. Now, Wolek uh, suggests that this island was probably Tehran, which is on the southern coast of Yemen. In the end, the Nabataean merchants allied themselves with the Himyarite Empire that lay on the southern coast. The other southern Arabian kingdoms did not touch the sea, but they, all their capital cities uh, were facing inland towards the caravan route. Now, as the overland caravans grew fewer and fewer, trade switched to the maritime route. And this was all about avoiding paying extra taxes and the rising costs. Okay. Within a few years, the Himyarite kingdom grew in strength and power and riches, while the other kingdom struggled and eventually caved in to Himyarite domination. Navigation on the water was much different the navigation on land. The boats on the Red Sea relied mostly on the measurement of the height of the North Star, as the Red Sea is a long and narrow strip of water, and so uh, the navigators concentrated on uh, just going north, and they would just judge how far north and south they were. Now, other navigators at this time began to concentrate on the crossing of the Indian Ocean. Now, once Chinese envoys arrived in Arabia, and that's about 100 AD, we've talked about this in the past, Nabataean representatives returned with those Chinese envoys to China. And thus, links between China and Arabia were firmly established. And this earliest date we have for this is around 100 AD. Now, Muhammad would not come onto the scene for another 400 years, and by that time, land-based navigation was a thing of the past. And the skills that were known to a few of those merchants who traveled in Arabia was just uh, known to a few. The emphasis was on crossing the water and going to India and going to Sri Lanka where they would meet the Chinese boats. This is why it is important to remember that Muhammad made merchant trips. We know of at least one trip that he took up to Basra in Syria. 
It may have been on this trip that Muhammad honed his skills in celestial navigation. He obviously would have been aware of it. It may have been on that trip that Muhammad became fascinated with the skills of writing poetry that contained a fixed number of beats. I believe this is why Muhammad's earliest composition started with a series of letters which represented numbers, giving us the number of beats in the composition. Today, these are known as mukat, or the magic numbers in the Quran. Only the earliest surahs have these numbers. But what is the... But only the earliest surahs have these numbers. But that is the topic for another video sometime in the future, as the problem with Mokat is that changes and additions were later made to the Quran, and the Mokat, or the numbers of the beats, became meaningless over time. Now, I've really gotten myself into uh, off the track and into another whole theory. Uh, let's go back to the navigation. One of the problems we face with uncovering and discovering the ancient methods used by the Nabataeans is that they were secretive about their methods. They didn't want others to be able to copy them and hone in on their uh, special trade. They had a monopoly on this trade. And so far, uh, so far, and so far as we know, Nothing was written down about how they calculated their directions and their angles. The earliest we know of are uh, Ahmed ibn Tabura or Tabrawa and Al -Ak Akiri. Both of uh, these have Persian names. Now, Al Akiri sailed around 400 AD, so that's about a thousand years after Christ. And these two wrote navigational works, which were the basis for the later three writers known as the Three Lions. They wrote about a hundred years later. However, the Three Lions were only academics who had no practical experience in navigating ships. Around this time, a number of reference books were being written known as Rahmani, or pilot guides, with the names of the ports and the measurements attached to that port. So what was the, the height above the, uh, the, of the north uh, uh, star that was up uh, there? Sorry, we're going to go back. Around this time, a number of reference books were being written known as Rahmani, or pilot guides, with the names of ports and measurements attached to that port. All of these works were about navigation on the Red Sea, not about the previous methods of navigating on land and guiding camel caravans. That is because when these writers were writing, they were hundreds and hundreds of years after the end of the camel caravans. These writers all made reference to land-based navigation, but their, by their time, everyone was interested in navigating on the ocean. So no written records have come down to us. Ibn Majid had access to the Three Lion Mag manuscripts, and uh, they took their information from the two earlier writers, all of whom were interested in recording how navigators found their way across the Indian Ocean. Pause. Now, when I began this video series, I likened this search to discovering how the pyramids were built. We know that they were built. We know lots about ancient Egyptians, but we lack a couple of key concepts. For instance, we do not understand how the Egyptians cut rock. Without that knowledge, we cannot reproduce how they built the pyramids. Pause. And so, with the Nabataeans, we are missing a few basic key items that keep us from being able to reproduce a workable model of how their navigation was done. We do know that they could measure the cardinal directions 
uh, accurately, and they could fill in all 224 points on the Arab uh, windrows. We know that they could measure the distance from one place to another. We know that they could measure the height of stars in the sky. We know that they tracked uh, 32 stars as they rose and as they set. And uh, we know they could even tell time by tracking these stars. So how did they calculate their angles? Now, before you get too disappointed, there are simple methods that they could have used early on. Now, I know that some academics have belittled this idea, but I strongly believe that pigeons may have played an early role. All across the Middle East, there are what appears to be the remains of ancient pigeon roosts. Pigeons have long been used in the Middle East for long distance communications. There are records of pigeons being used by the early Muslims to communicate from both uh, Damascus and also from Baghdad. Sorry, I have to pause again. Pigeons, especially carrier pigeons, have the ability to fly straight back to where their nests are. Some of these pigeons can be taken overland to a distant destination. Then the messengers would re, uh, put a, a, a message, tie it to their legs, and they would let the pigeons go, and the pigeons would fly straight back home. This was used as a form of communication for many years. I know it was used all the way up until World War I. They still used carrier pigeons or pigeons to send messages back to England from the battlefields in France. We know that the ancient Persians developed the art of training pigeons. One of the earliest records we have is about the Romans using pigeon messengers uh, to aid their military. Fortinus said that Julius Caesar used pigeons as messengers in his conquest of Gaul. So the idea of using pigeons is not so improbable. The Arabs also kept pigeons and used them as messengers. There are records of uh, pigeons being used in Baghdad for mail service soon after the city was built. Another, wait, sorry. Flights as long as 1,800 kilometers have been recorded by birds in competitive pigeon racing. This would put all of Syria, Iraq, and Iran within flying distance of Petra. Now, the Forbidden Sanctuary had pigeons. We know this from the writings of El Tabri. The horse, uh, I'm quoting this, the horse of one of them began to drop dung, and the pigeons of the area uh, started to scavenge the droppings. Al Hussein reined back his horse from them, and Ibn al Zabur said, What's the matter with you? He said, I am afraid lest my horse kill the pigeons of the sanctuary area. Now, in my personal correspondence with Dr. Richard Holland of the School of Biological Science, this is at Bang, uh, Bangor University in the UK, he stated, some studies suggest that how he stated that some studies suggest that knowing where to go immediately after release. In my personal correspondence with Dr. Richard Holland from the School of Biological Sciences at Bangor University in the UK, he stated that some uh, studies suggested that the pigeons know where to go immediately after release. He said it's difficult to measure the accuracy of their compass mechanism, but the dominant one during the day, because they had several ways that pigeons calculate distance, the dominant one during the day that was the sun compass uh, is thought to be very accurate. Now, most GPS uh, tracking have shown that repeated release from the same place, pigeons recapitulate uh, the route very accurately. They, the challenge is in uh, releasing 
uh, not just one pigeon, but a, a series of pigeons, one after the other, and then watching the direction in which they go. And as they usually, they will circle and then head home. And so um, that's a means of uh, giving direction. So the the person standing in the Arab standing in the middle of his compass releases the pigeon. He sees them go off, and then they head straight that way. And on his compass, he knows the exact angle that they. Uh, are, would be going. And so this has been tested and it has been, uh, the research is going on in this area. So it is possible that Qiblas were set without any science and without any maps, at least back at the very earliest time. It is possible that there were known distances between some of these cities and that pigeons were used to, to communicate back and forth bet between major cities. And so your uh, merchants knew the direction that uh, those major cities were. This is especially to, true if there was regular pigeon transport between two locations. Now, a good example of this would have been between Petra and Jerusalem. King Herod of Jerusalem married the daughter of King Aretas of the Nabataeans of Petra. So it is conceivable that the queen had means of communication with her home city, especially when she was married to someone as unstable as King Herod. And history tells us that eventually she did fall out of favor with the king and was sent home. Pause. So if this is the case, then some of these angles between the cities could have been established over the centuries by the use of these pigeon uh, mail systems. Remember, the early Arab merchants made these trips repeatedly for hundreds of years. They established merchant enclaves in all of the major cities of the Middle East. Nabataeans lived in those cities and trade would go back and forth between the different Nabataean groups and the, those Nabataeans would trade in the city. So uh, information was one of the important things that the Nabataeans uh, they sold to people. So they would want to be able to have communication and they would want to know these directions and they would rely on uh, the angles that were there and the isharat, the, the, the local things that uh, you would know as you went from one location to another. Now in time, more and more routes were added to their knowledge. Now while this may seem incredible to young people today who rely on their GPS units, it's not too long ago that people knew their way around several different cities. In my travels and my living in different places, I knew my way around at least a dozen large cities in the Middle East. Uh, because the Arabs had the 32 different directions in their mental compass, they could give specific directions to others using those 32 points. But how did they fit it all together? So far, I have not come across any book or manuscript that explains the final steps of how they used this information. We know about the use of the Arab windrows because it's still in use today by some Arab Dao pilots. But they are quickly disappearing because using a GPS is just so much easier. Sorry, this is taking very long. We know about the use of counting steps from the Roman records. We know about the use of poetry from a few surviving Bedouin. These old men remembered something of the old days, but I spoke with them years ago. Under the onslaught of modern technology, the old methods are dying out, the young people aren't interested in these things, and sadly, this whole knowledge of poetry may have already died out. But I still cling to one hope. All around the world, old Arabic manuscripts are still being found. Perhaps someday we will learn the secret of the ancients about how they did navigation. You see, there are a collection of ancient manuscripts that have been 
carefully examine that you see there are collections of ancient manuscripts that have never been carefully examined there are a quarter million ancient manuscripts in Ethiopia we don't even know what they all are there are thousands of documents from medieval the medieval Sudanese Empire of uh, Makur, Mak <coughs> okay Makuria we're going way back and now we have to count all the way up till we get there it's gonna be an editing nightmare you see there are collections of ancient manuscripts that have never carefully been examined there are a quarter million ancient manuscripts in Ethiopia alone we don't even know what they all are there are thousands of documents from the medieval Sudanese Empire of Makuria written in eight different languages these come from Qasr Ibrim thousands of old manuscripts have survived in West African cities as well oh boy we are speeding up you can see some of these mentioned at the bottom of the screen despite the many dangers uh, that were came but from fire and flood and insects and pillaging some one million manuscripts have survived from the northern fringes of Guinea and Ghana up to the northern shores of the Mediterranean the National Geographic estimates that there are 700,000 manuscripts that have survived in Timbuktu alone Timbuktu was an ancient university town there were around 60 libraries and they're still there owned by local families and institutions some of these libraries are being cataloged and a few are being photographed and preserved oh boy now from our studies there are four different types of texts that are found in Timbuktu in the libraries first of all there are key texts of Islam this is including old Qurans hadiths Sufi texts and so forth second there are the works of the Maliki school of Islamic law third there are texts of Islamic sciences including mathematics and astronomy and Arabic grammar and fourth there are some original works from the region including contract uh, uh, contracts and commentaries and historical chronologies and uh, poetry and marginal notes and just jottings on papers soon after 1100 CE Timbuktu became a thriving economic center with a great deal of African gold passing through it the city was rich in the trade of textiles um, and uh, of even uh, tobacco however the most profitable item in Timbuktu were books buying them was considered a socially acceptable way of, exp of displaying your wealth and uh, it was a great source of prestige our family has so many books for instance an old uh, Timbuktu chronicle called uh, Tariq al Fatash it reveals that the king at one time bought a great dictionary for the equivalent price of two horses there were many different languages in West Africa such as Fulani and Hausa and Toreg but the Arabic was the major trade language and during the 14th century while plagues were killing many in Europe West Africa became one of the richest places in the entire world Dee, 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 dee. I'm so sorry, this is going a little slow. The West Africans pursued knowledge and they loved to display their collection of books. In time, thousands of teachers were att attracted to this region, and science and medicine advanced. And by the 1500 scribes were employed to copy old books 
and the sale of books provided more profit than from any other branch of trade in the city. At its height, the Sancor University had 25,000 students. Many of them were also employed in other industries like uh, textiles so they could pay for their studies. Now today, all that remains of all of this are a few buildings and the books, thousands of books. Many of them are unique. John O. Hunwick and uh, Alida J. Boll in their book, The Hidden Treasures of Timbuktu, tell us of a letter that was 482 pages long. Imagine getting a letter 482 pages long. These are the kinds of things you will find in that library, in all those libraries. Now, many books are held in private collections, in private homes. And since so many books have been destroyed by invading armies or by the ravages of the climate, these families are reluctant to reveal what books that they have. If this all comes as a surprise to you, then let's quickly review a bit of history. Now I'm going to take this history, it's coming from the book Rediscovering the Islamic Classics, How Editors and Print uh, Cultures Transformed the Intellectual Tradition. And this is by Ahmed E. El Shamsi, who is an economic professor of Islamic thought at the University of Chicago. Oh my goodness. In his book, El Shamsi tracks the slow acceptance of movable type in the Middle East, which was only adopted in the early 19th century. It wasn't until the second half of the century that the first works of classical Islam were printed. El Shamsi traces the story of how a handful of editors and intellectuals slowly brought into print what is today the classical canon of Islamic thought. In the 20th century, much of this was done in Cairo, although a few other cities such as Beirut, Lebanon also played a role. What is surprising about all of this is the late dates involved. On my bookshelf, I have books, uh, some, a few books from the 1700s. I have quite a few books from the 1800s. They're not considered really, really old. Old books go way back in European history. The Western tradition of printing books, I mean with movable type, goes back several hundred years. So many older books are available to us in the West. The digitite... Uh, the, digi the digitation of old books has been ongoing for decades now, and many of them are freely available on the internet. Plus, individuals like myself included have digitized many other books for our own private use. Okay. But there are over a million books and texts from Islamic sources that are only now being catalogued, let alone digitized. Very few of them have been studied. Very few young Arabs today are interested in their own history. Please, if you're a native Arabic speaker and are looking for a possible career, consider studying history, especially the many books and manuscripts and the fragments that have not yet been published. There are rich resources and your help is needed. In the last few years, I've only scratched at the surface and I am optimistic that the answers we are looking for are still out there. So I am still holding out that something more has survived that will tell us of the secrets of early navigation, about their poetry and about astronomy. If not, then perhaps the secrets of the Nabataean merchants will disappear and be lost to us. 
What remains, however, are the Qiblas of ancient buildings, especially the Umayyads, who were early enough to still have among them Arabs who knew the early secrets of finding their way across the barren deserts of Arabia and arriving at destinations that were far uh, beyond the horizon. I'm going to back that up. What remains, however, are the Qiblas of ancient buildings, especially those built by the Umayyads, who were still early enough to have among them Arabs who knew the secrets of finding their way across the barren deserts of Arabia. They knew how to arrive at a destination that was over the horizon. I'm Dan Gibson, and this has been another video in the series, How Did the Early Muslims Calculate? the Qibla direction. <coughs> oh my goodness. I guess we'll back up. What remains, however, are the Qiblas of ancient buildings, especially those built by the Umayyads, who were still early enough to have among them Arabs who knew the earlier secrets of finding their way across the barren deserts of Arabia. They knew how to arrive at a destination that was over the horizon. I'm Dan Gibson, and this has been another video in the series, How Did the Early Muslims Calculate the Qibla Direction? That is where we